Imagine being awakened in the dead of night by a loud pop. You're not even too sure what you heard. Still groggy, you try to go back to sleep until a loud boom just jumps you out of your bed. You go look out the window. There's a car completely engulfed in flames. The popping that you were hearing were the tires bursting. The boom, that was the gas tank exploding. So you grab that phone and you make that call. Where's your emergency? There's a fire right outside of my, my apartment. Well, they found a body in the trunk. Detectives round up the usual suspects, and one suspect was acting very unusual. When the detectives told this person the gruesome manner in which the victim died, well, there was a lack of emotion. This person asked detectives a most perplexing question. A question that I could only imagine a robot asking its human maker, and that question was, how am I supposed to respond to this? What's going on guys, it's the Left Hand Monkey and welcome to the first episode of Monkey Tale. Shout out to Alex Richards for coming up with that corny title. Other people came up with that corny title after, but you were the first, so you are King Corn. Here we're going to share intriguing true stories, wherever we can find it, from true crime, my personal favorite, to the supernatural. Now, I want to clarify, I don't believe in ghosts. I'm on the fence about aliens, but in my heart, I do want to believe in both. But I'm that gotta see it to believe it guy, so just believe me if I ever say I see it. So, the case that we have for you today, it has a murder, it has a kindergarten teacher in handcuffs, an attempted suicide, we even have a hitman that's never killed anybody, so just sit back and relax, grab yourselves a snack, I call this one, Controlling Little Humans. If you Google the definition of carefree, you get free from anxiety or responsibility. And a picture of Stephen Moore could have easily accompanied that. A California boy spending his days enjoying the great weather and sandy beaches. So even when high school ended, when the age of responsibility came calling, he watched his friends accept the charges, but he, he just hung up and went back to enjoy the rest of his day. That's not to say he was lazy. Oh no, his mother Evelyn would tell you. Stephen was just laid back, but he was willing to take up the hard work when need be. He just didn't care about the excesses that most of us enjoy. It was just a headache to him. He simply didn't need much. He simply didn't want much. The man didn't want much, but he did want something. And that something is a bit frivolous when I tell you, but I think it's very important into understanding Stephen's underlying character. And that something was a damn good pair of skates. Now, if you were a beachgoer in the 90s, you might have seen him zipping around on his skates going at breakneck speeds. He was fast. He was fast enough to get third at nationals. You don't just get third at nationals. That takes a lot of hard work and dedication. So, like his mama said, he was not lazy that if Steven need be, he could be. He loved the life he created for himself. The people around him adored him, and he loved them back. But no one, of course, compared to Mom. So when Evelyn Moore decided to retire in New Jersey, even though it was on the other side of the country, even though it meant leaving his carefree life behind, he didn't hesitate. He packed up because he wanted to take care of his mom. So when Stephen first gets to New Jersey, he would spend those first couple of years darting around on his skates, getting accustomed to a new shore, keeping his mom company. And then, in 2006, he met a sweet young kindergarten teacher named Kathleen Dorsett. Well, it turns out, opposites do attract, because as vivacious and carefree as Stephen was, Kathleen was every bit as grounded and responsible. She had a full-time job, she owned her own home. She would just, uh, you know, took life a bit more serious. And Stephen, well, he knew if he wanted to keep this one, you know, he, he's going to have to grow up a bit. So he finally hung up his skates. He was already pushing 40 at this point. So he got himself a real job at the local Honda dealership. And by all accounts, he was a great employee and a great co-worker. Everybody loved him. And... Kathleen, well, she was loving what she saw, so shortly after, in 2007, they got married. Now, Kathleen's parents, they lived just across the street from Kathleen, and they just welcomed Stephen in with open arms. He was now a part of the family, and he felt loved. He was elated. And I want you to picture this, okay? Just a year and a half down the line, 
Picture Steven and his mom holding each other and they're crying in a nursery as they're staring at Steven's newborn baby girl, Elizabeth. Now, like most parents, you never knew how much more love you had to give until you hold your child for the first time and that's how Steven was feeling. And even Kathleen, Kathleen turned out to be a real natural at being a mother and this was really shaping up to be a coming of age fairy tale. Well, we wouldn't be talking about it here on this channel if it ended that way, sadly. It was an early August morning of 2010. Police and firefighters were dispatched to a burning vehicle. The car was a 2001 Nissan Altima, and when they ran the registration, it came back belonging to that of Evelyn Moore, Stephen's mom. Now maybe if she had just chosen another place to retire in, or maybe she could have just stayed, enjoyed her golden years in the Golden State, then maybe Stephen wouldn't have ended up in the trunk of that burning car. So from here, we actually have to rewind back a few days when the ever-reliable Stephen Moore didn't show up for work. His co-workers got worried, they called Kathleen, and she said, well, I haven't seen him since the morning he dropped off Elizabeth. So they decided to call Evelyn, his mom, and she was, I haven't heard from Stephen all day either. I'm actually not even in town. She was vacationing in Maine at the time, so now panic starts to set in for everybody okay so now steven's missing but the co-workers didn't want to jump the gun and call the police too early you know just in case steven just walks in and says guys my car died and then my phone died you know just one of those days that never happened and they filed the missing person that missing person of course turned into a homicide when somebody set ablaze evelyn's car with Steven in the trunk. Now Steven was so severely burned, burnt beyond recognition. The only way that they were able to identify the body was by a surviving tattoo that somehow survived all the flames. <sighs> Detectives took the logical steps and talked to the people closest to Steven, his mom and his wife. Evelyn Moore was vacationing in Maine when she got the call and there was just no reason to believe that she was involved. They moved on to the wife, Kathleen, a dedicated kindergarten teacher at the local elementary, an attentive mother and loving wife. Well, ex-wife actually, as she would explain to detectives. Stephen had actually moved out some time ago, and due to irreconcilable differences, they had gotten a divorce. Now before we move on, I should at least tell you about Kathleen's parents, Tommy and Leslie. Now. They were the real salts of the earth, for a lack of a better description, because Tommy literally was salting the earth when he was shoveling snow off his neighbor's lawn. Just a neighborly gesture. Everybody loved this guy in the community. Not a bad word said. He owned his own refrigeration business, and he would even offer his skill set, you know, just to people who needed help. So... That was Tommy Dorsett. So what about Leslie? Leslie was also a prominent figure in the community. She was running for the Ocean Township School Board and she even ran an ad and here it is. Today, I wanted to introduce myself and tell you who I am and why I am qualified to serve you. So needless to say, a very popular family in the community. Now guys, <clears throat> remember I said Kathleen was a real natural at being a mother? Well. I forgot to add the word fucker at the end of that. She was a real natural at being a motherfucker. A real bitch is what I'm trying to say. Turns out everything started to fall apart for Steven once Elizabeth was born, sadly. His only error was that he loved his daughter to death. And Kathleen, well, she too loved her daughter to Steven's death. Kathleen found everything wrong with how Steven would feed the baby, how he would even hold the baby. Now, to new parents, okay? To make you guys feel better, instinctively, you guys should know how to hold the baby. As long as you are gentle, as long as the baby can breathe, you're doing a fine, bang-up job. Now, just don't drop the baby. That's a big no-no. I dropped my baby once, but he's perfectly fine. <laughs> now, it's pretty apparent to me 
that Kathleen had control issues. She was a kindergarten teacher, so she was used to telling little humans what to do, and I guess she thought she could tell big humans what to do, too. And those that didn't get in line, well, they got punished, right? One very public incident was when Kathleen took Elizabeth to go see Stephen at work. And it wasn't to make Stephen feel all warm and fuzzy inside and loved. No, it was to make him embarrassed in front of all his co-workers because once she got there and she said okay here hold your daughter once he was holding Elizabeth the claws came out and it was nag 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 you're doing this wrong you're doing that wrong you're an idiot to the point where Stephen just had to just give Elizabeth back to Kathleen and just try to defend himself I guess because they had a full-on argument after that and uh <sighs> the night before Stephen went missing, he was happily telling his mom that he was watching a movie with Elizabeth in their jammies and having a great time. Now this is a very special night, a monumental night for Stephen, because this was the night he had long dreamed of and fought for with Kathleen, and he was finally granted by the court nighttime visitations. That following morning, he would drop Elizabeth off at Kathleen's, and that would be the last known sighting of Stephen Moore. Detectives dug deeper into the relationship. They started to hear about some concerning behaviors. A friend of Stephen stated, Kathleen had gone mad with motherhood and told detectives the story of when Stephen gave baby Elizabeth a taste of sauerkraut and Kathleen freaked out, screaming at the top of her lungs that is not good for a baby. Now, I didn't want to discredit Kathleen off the bat without googling first if sauerkraut was actually bad for an infant and it turns out it's actually a great way to introduce sour foods to an infant as long as you give it a little bit and that's exactly what uh, Stephen's friend claimed happened that Stephen only gave the baby a smidgen. Then there were the days when Stephen would pick up Elizabeth for their time together. He wasn't just picking up Elizabeth. He was picking up a worksheet, some prepackaged foods, and some choice words from Kathleen. Warnings. What he had to do was fill out that worksheet when she went to bed, when she pooped, when she peed. I don't know, maybe even when she cried. And the prepackaged food, that was the only food he was allowed to give her. Or else. And she would call him every hour, sometimes multiple times an hour, just to make sure everything's going her way. You know, making sure Stephen's not screwing everything up and that Elizabeth's okay. Basically, imposing herself on time that belonged to Stephen. And these were just some of the stories that detectives were hearing, you know, trying to understand the relationship between Kathleen and Stephen. And guess what? It was Stephen that left something behind that would prove priceless to the case. He started recording conversations. I'm going to tell you for the last time, we are following the schedule we've been following since we got a divorce. And I don't get a what you think. You're right, my way or the highway. There were some mean things spewing out of that kindergarten teacher. She would call so much. Stephen would just let all the calls go to voicemail. He would just save those. And here we are. This is a case of when a controlling woman basically read the room wrong. What I mean by that is she finagled the wrong guy who she thought was a carefree pushover that she could just trick to get to marry her, impregnate her, basically just a sperm donor. And when the baby is born, wants nothing to do with him anymore. And then she is incensed that he had the audacity to fight for his child? Mm. Now the final situation that we're going to talk about is probably what cost Stephen his life. And it really didn't need to happen if Kathleen had just talked to Evelyn Moore. Because she would have told Kathleen that her son was not a pushover. Oh no. He was just laid back. That he will fight you tooth and nail for the things that he loves. Bitch. A couple of months before Stephen's disappearance, Kathleen already made plans to move to a house they were building in Florida with Elizabeth and her parents, which is a major problem when there is dual custody. 
Of course, Stephen wasn't just going to let Elizabeth go, so he worked with his lawyer to iron out an agreement, a very odd one, but one that would resolve the issue if the Dorsets agreed. The stipulation. Okay, you were, can stop right there because I have to tell it. This is epic. Okay, so the stipulations were. Okay, oh, so you want to move to Florida with my daughter. Okay, that's fine. You know, you just have to take me with you. Okay, and if you choose to live in an upscale neighborhood, well, I guess you have to find me an upscale apartment because I need to be in proximity of my daughter and I can only afford $600 a month. That's all I could afford. I crunched the numbers. You guys would just have to flip the rest of the rent. I guess, no, wait. You guys will also financially support me while I look for a job. And that's the only way you are going to Florida with my daughter. And if you think, <laughs> if you think about it, you have to have some nerves to lay out those stipulations. And um, he was, uh, he was a good one. We lost a good one, guys. And he should be here right now, you know, roller skating with his daughter. And that house in Florida that she was constructing, detectives did a little digging on it. And they found out. That house was almost complete. I googled how long it takes on average in the US from a house zero to complete. It was seven months on average, seven months. That's, that was a long time ago, way before Steven even knew about any of this. And you know what that means? It just means Kathleen gave a shit about whether Steven was going to agree or not. When Steven was reading those stipulations, she was just like, oh yeah, $600, if that's all you could afford, you could financially support you? Of course. But inside her head, she was just going to kill him. When the medical examiner's report came back to the actual cause of death, detectives raced to inform Kathleen. They told her that Stephen was already dead before he was placed in the trunk. It was actually blunt force trauma to the head and strangulation that killed him. Now, detectives were already disturbed by Kathleen's lack of emotion when she asked them that even more disturbing question. How am I supposed to respond to this? Like a fucking human being, he was your ex-husband. Aren't you supposed to care? You couldn't even be bothered to just maybe even look in the mirror. Practice, practice, or practice. And you could have your fake emotions. <laughs> Who do this? Entertain the idea that the cops could actually do their jobs and they would come back to you, present you with how Steven actually died because they figured it out. And instead, how am I supposed to respond to this? <laughs> Sorry, guys. I just find Kathleen so annoying. A round of questioning the neighbors produces an interesting story that makes its way back to the lead detectives. So the night of August 16, the night before Stephen was reported missing, a neighbor was awakened by what they thought were screams and went to look out the window. They saw Kathleen milling about in the back of the house and asked if she was okay and were met with a stern, everything's fine, close your windows. Later that morning, Kathleen would go over to their house and explained that it was their dogs having a seizure. So detectives pretty much knew they had a crime scene on their hands because they sent out for the entire crime scene unit. And Kathleen, being the psychopath that she is, she just continued to have her little chit chat. She was unfazed by any of this, still talking about her open house. Please keep everything, you know, nice and neat. We got to sell this house so we can move to Florida. We're even laying down this new mulch and detectives looked at that mulch. It was a little bit peculiar. You know, the placement, some places had it, some places didn't. So they called up forensics before they got there and go, you know what, guys, the first place you should look, look at that mulch. And that's exactly what forensics did. They put on their gloves, stuck their hands in that mulch, pulled it back out. It was bloody red. And I'm not talking about a little bit of blood. There was a lot of blood, a lot of human blood. And it turns out a lot of Steven's blood. And that was enough to send good old Kathleen down to the station. She refused to answer anything without her lawyer. So that was that. That was fine with detectives because they wanted to sleep on it anyways to make sure their case was airtight. 
And if she still smelled like a murderer, when they woke up, then they would just go ahead and go get her. They woke up, she still smelled like a murderer, and that's exactly what they did. But then things get a little bit strange. Shortly after, Kathleen's father Thomas attempts suicide by inhaling gas from a 30-pound refrigerant canister while parked in his lawyer's lot. This attempt failed to kill him, but he fell into a coma. Then out of the blue, a restaurant calls the police, says the security camera recorded something very peculiar that they should see. They rushed over, and here's what they saw. That was Thomas Dorset throwing some items away from his work van. Seemed random, non-eventful, until... Just an hour prior, you have Thomas scoping out the same trash bin in a 2001 Nissan Altima, Evelyn Moore's car. And following right behind dear old daddy, yet Kathleen in her own car. Eventually, Thomas would come out of his coma and straight into a jail cell. With insurmountable evidence stacked against them, both were ultimately convicted, Thomas getting 45 years to life and Kathleen getting 58. So what exactly happened to Stephen that fateful morning? Let's hear it from Kathleen herself as she confessed in court. On August 16th, 2010, at approximately 7.30 a.m., Stephen Moore came to my residence to Moffitt Place, Oakers, New Jersey. For a scheduled drop off, our door was approximately 30 minutes prior to Stephen's arrival. He texted me that he was on his way. When he arrived, I told Stephen to go get his tools in the back. I took my daughter into the house, knowing all the time my father was back there waiting to kill him. As I was changing Elizabeth's diaper, I heard screaming coming from the driveway. By the time I secured my child and ran outside, Stephen was in the driveway, lying in the driveway sat down next to him in order to shield him from view of my next door neighbor, Janice Green, who was yelling out her window asking me who was wrong. I repeated several times to Janice that everything was all right and that she should shut her window. After my conversation with Janice concluded, I insisted that my father was lifting Stephen's body into the trunk of my ex-mother in law's vehicle. My father drew up off with the car and shortly thereafter he telephoned me to meet him at Bernie's restaurant in Long Beach. I met him there and then followed him to another location in Wolverine. In the vehicle, the student's dead body in it was abandoned. I then drove my father home. After we had arrived at my residence, we cleaned up the area where Stephen was killed, and my father drove away with the clean up items. I know that he disposed of everything in the dumpster. I know now <laughs> that he disposed of everything in the dumpster at Rudy's restaurant. The judge would remark that her tears were crocodile and that he believed her emotions while reading her confession were not genuine. Now this is where I should say the end. If Kathleen was a normal villain, but her pettiness fueled by her stupidity knew no bounds. Listen to these jail conversations she had with her mother. How much can you come up with in cash? I told you. Just a thousand? That's it? That's not all I have left? Kathleen mentions needing cash, an odd statement for an inmate to make. This conversation would continue later during a visitation where Kathleen would elaborate for her mother why the cash was needed. When the two talked in person, police knew that Kathleen and her mother were up to something, so they sought cooperation with Kathleen's cellmate who informed them that Kathleen had indeed asked if she had connections to a hitman. Detectives instructed the cellmate to go ahead and play along with Kathleen's request to say she had just the man for the job. What we discussed at the visit? Yeah. His time is already in motion. You need to do your part. Remember natural? Write that. The word diabetic. That's it. And the original amount I told you is money. One thousand. 
someone will meet you there. It's not even going to be someone, you know. Police set up a sting operation to record Leslie Dorsett paying this hitman, which of course was an undercover cop. Leslie hands the hitman a picture with the address on the back, a thousand dollars, and instructions to make it look natural. Well, tab. Hi. How much is in here? A thousand. Cash. Cash. One hundred, two, three, four. How do you want this done? Looking at the natural. 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 It's possible. So, like a poisoning, or you tell me. She's a diabetic. Leslie was arrested and given seven years on conspiracy to commit murder. Now all the Dorsets are in jail. Well, except until 2016, when Leslie was paroled. But did you guys figure out who the picture was with the address on the back, who they were trying to knock off? It was Evelyn Moore. But why? Because she got sole custody of Elizabeth. Big girl. Hi there. Oh, daddy loves you. Oh, daddy loves you. Yes, he does. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, don't forget to like and subscribe because that's the only way I'll know that you guys want me to make more of this content. And leave a nice comment because that's good for the soul, mine's and yours. But, guys, if you know a naked baby, or you know someone who's about to have a naked baby, I have the solution. Me and my wife, we run a little online onesie shop, okay? We design everything in-house and anything that you guys purchase there directly supports us, directly supports this channel, me, my wife, and our little two-year-old. And uh, thank you, and I'll see you guys in the next Monkey Tales.